So welcome to our presentation. Uh, Diana and I are so excited to share about this open pedagogy project and research with you. Before we begin, we want to acknowledge that the University of Arizona is on the land of indigenous peoples and in, in a state that's home to 22 tribes. I'm Diana Daly. I'm an assistant professor and the head of iVoices Media Lab at the University of Arizona iSchool. And I'm Cheryl Casey. I'm the Open Education Librarian at the University of Arizona. And Diana and I met in 2020 through a learning community for Pressbooks. Um, and this is the story of how that community uh, transformed the way that Diana taught her large gen ed class, how she led the creation of the University of Arizona's first big project in uh, Pressbooks, and how her incredible open pedagogy project became the focus of my recent sabbatical research. Uh, here we define open pedagogy as involving students in the creation of openly licensed materials. In today's presentation, we'll provide background on how this project began and on a larger project called iVoices Media Lab, through which the open textbook Humans Are Social Media was produced. Cheryl will also share findings on her research on learning outcomes in this project, and we'll share what we've learned and a key list of resources. We'll try to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. Um, on our program page in SCED, and Diana's put the, the link there in the chat, we've shared these Google Slides along with the memorandum of understanding that Diana used for students in the class, um, the survey questions, for students and a handout with open pedagogy resources. And these are all licensed CC BY, so you can reuse and adapt them. So to begin, in fall of 2020, I launched the iVoices Media Lab with the purpose of integrating student stories into curricula and scholarship around technologies. I'm the instructor of a large 150 cap gen ed course on social media. And so that became the center for the project. For the first half of the three year project period, I've used funding for this project to hire a team of student media lab workers to teach students to produce media. And the workers also produce media themselves and with me. The goal of iVoices is to channel students funds of knowledge about technologies they're already immersed in. So, Users make sense of technologies personally, ideologically, and culturally, ideally leading to individualized knowledge and literacy. As an Hispanic serving institution, we at the University of Arizona must be especially responsive to diversity along cultural lines in students' media backgrounds. Consider a student with tech literacy developed in their unique background walking into a class and then being presented with curricula that feels disconnected from these literacies. That student may leave the classroom feeling less knowledgeable about new media than when the class began. So I created iVoices as an alternative to that, to make students' funds of knowledge part of what's taught in class. That was the theory anyway. I was very fortunate that our university and Cheryl here arranged to license press books for institutional use right around when the iVoices project began. And so my theoretical plan for integrating student media into curricula suddenly had a shape, an open textbook. I already had a simple 10 chapter textbook that I'd created called Humans Are Social Media that would become the very first stub for the open textbook. And so my first use of project funding was to pay a graduate assistant to migrate the Humans Are Social Media textbook to press books. Migrating to Pressbooks initiated the teaching phase of the project. Uh, as part of that phase, next, I hired a team of undergraduate media lab workers with skills in video, audio, and graphic media production. They've worked with me to design media lab assignments like this one. And I'm just going to play a short clip. That's right, people. For Project 3, you're making a meme. From the photo to the editing, everything must be made by you. Please note, you don't have to use a certain program for this assignment. You can use Illustrator if you want, or Photoshop, or you could do what I did. I used social media. I'm going to show you quickly how I made this meme using either Snapchat or Instagram. In response to these media lab assignments, the students of the course composed text-based stories, audio stories, videos, and graphics. 
We make these projects low stakes, each worth no more than 10% of the student's grade with several due per semester. Here you can see our general rubric. For accessibility, all students um, can benefit from, we teach practicing the principles of universal design for learning. So instructions are in multiple formats, such as videos, writing, and live workshops with ample repetition. We have lots of workshops and help, not only on producing the projects, but on licensing and open culture, including guest presentations by Cheryl as our open education librarian. We also offer students shortcuts for integrating Creative Commons content into their work, such as our iVoices Innovation Pack, which is a playlist of short Creative Commons licensed tracks made for class reuse by one of our media lab workers, Gabe Stoltz. To help the class find other reusable music for audio stories, students were given extra credit for sharing music they found in a class forum, provided they included the title, author, or artist, source, and license, or tassel, um, and provided the license was reusable for the book. At the end of the semester, students fill out a memorandum of understanding where they choose what to openly license for use in the textbook and other materials. I've revised our processes around the MOU every semester to better fit students' understandings and offer increased agency for them. Um, so in our first semester, fall 2020, I was super eager for textbook content and I emphasized the benefits of open licensing a lot. I believe this approach was ethical enough uh, for use of that content, but in hindsight, I could have been more student-centered in how I presented that choice to them. Um, I had also that semester offered for them to choose from a menu of Creative Commons licenses. However, everyone in the 75% of the class who chose to openly license chose CC BY, uh, which is the open license they'd learned the most about from us. About one quarter of the class chose all rights reserved. Our grading team, including myself, did not know who made these decisions until after final grades were input. In our second semester of the project, spring 21, I was beginning to organize a mountain of content from the previous semester. Knowing we had far more than we needed um, and understanding a little bit more about the nature of these stories the students were telling, I presented the decision around the MOU more in the context of students' lives. I said, this is your decision. Don't worry about us. We have plenty of content. Contribute and openly license if that truly feels good to you. Ultimately, a little over half the students in the class chose to openly license and contribute work, a lower percentage than the previous semester, maybe due to the more student-centered approach that I took. Um, I no longer offered license, license options in spring 21 other than CC BY and All Rights Reserved, um, but I did offer to partially or fully de-identify their work, um, and almost half of those who contributed elected this. Um, offering de-identification has turned out to be very time consuming for our team, uh, considering it involves video editing, audio editing, and graphical editing. Uh, but it feels like a student-centered practice, and so I'm continuing it for our final semester of this project teaching phase, which is fall 21 this, this semester. At the end of the teaching phase, the collection phase begins. Uh, I And this, this is a process that that goes over and over again. So we are in a collection phase and in a teaching phase right now, if that makes sense. Um, at the end of the teaching phase, in the collection phase, I supervise a team of interns, usually graduate students in our library and information science master's program to process our collection of student work. This has taken a few semesters to refine, but the spreadsheet at the top that you see is a visualization of how we do it now. We migrate all of the openly licensed work to Google Drive and link and contain all we can in a Google spreadsheet. The Google suite offers granular, excuse me, granular levels of security and useful previews of content from the spreadsheet. Um, each contributing student is a row and projects and their components are divided by columns. For Universal Design for Learning, we transcribe all audio and video. And when students request it, we remove their last names or full names, along with other identifying information about themselves and others in their stories. The publish phase is the next phase. The team of interns and I select content for the textbook. I'm still refining these processes, but an overarching theme has been inclusion of underrepresented perspectives, which is what iVoices is about. iVoices amplifies students' voices because they offer something different than what we find in scholarship and popular sources, and we particularly value critical perspectives and reflexivity. 
We also look for representative experiences. For example, the most interesting or salient iterations of stories we hear over and over from students. Students who work with the collections also make rec recommendations on what stands out to them personally. But on intern teams compile, excuse me, but on intern teams comprised primarily of white women like myself, it's been essential to gently, constantly decenter hegemonic perspectives. As part of the publish phase, which is the next phase, we also organize the spreadsheet for export to our campus repository and other unseen reusers. This means we remove absolutely everything that is not for the intended recipient or for external audiences at all. Our first repository collection is in development now. We also use student content in our own media, including our website and our podcast, social media, and ourselves. These stories are not like other open textbook content I've ever seen or read about. They're sometimes quite personal, as you can hear in this podcast episode about a student who appeared in a Disney commercial talking about her son and a Disney scholarship program she had participated in. I'm going to play a little clip here and uh, try to advance it. That's it may great. take a, just a little while to buffer. Once it started airing, I received a lot of support from friends and from my family. They sent text messages saying how they were loving that I would just randomly pop up onto their TV or in ads on their social media or games like Candy Crush. It wasn't until they started tagging me in the comments of these ads on social media that I saw the hate that was directed towards me. There were comments that said she should focus more on books and less on food. I need a bigger phone to see this ad. Mothers need to focus on their children, not books. Great, another kid for someone else to raise. She should have thought about school before she had a kid. What kind of mother works at Disneyland? She works at Disneyland, so of course she needs to make extra money so she'll exploit her kid. These random people talking about my weight or my ability to be a good mother if I'm going to work and go to school at the same time. This is completely out of the blue for me, and the negativity from strangers just blew me away. They don't know me or my life. So that was Chris Kelly you heard talking. She was my student intern and then interned for iVoices, working with student stories. And this was the story that she chose to tell. She chose the Creative Commons music for it, and she was very happy with what we produced. The first open textbook edition of Humans Are Social Media was released in May 2021 and can be found in the Open Textbook Library, in Merlot, and in other directories, and at our website, iVoices.iSchool.Arizona.edu. The May 2021 version includes student content in text boxes interspersed with the content of the original Humans Are Social Media stub. All the student content is from fall 2020, including this written post and graphic profile picture by Sofia Diaz, along with her audio content, which we won't play right now, but you're welcome to go find the book and, and listen on your own. We will play this next clip though. Ever since I could remember, I loved the internet. When I was first introduced to it, I found out I could message my friends and family around the world. I could say hello at any time. Time was never a problem in an online conversation. Though I can't say the same about my patients. I quickly learned my family weren't the only people I could talk to and follow online. There were amazing strangers and individuals I wanted to know. One of them being an incredibly talented artist who blew me away with his works. To say I flooded his DMs with endless questions would be an understatement. So that was Jackie Kudu. Uh, uh, she was a student in our class well, and she ended up joining our Media Lab team. Uh, we also have student content here from Trinity Norris and Alyssa DeLeon. Students also brainstormed glossary terms like hype beast here and wrote definitions. Some of these terms were added to the book's glossary to become core concepts of the class and components of the curriculum. 
Humans are social media is iterative. My class is now already seeing the newer version, but it's still unstable, so not being openly shared yet. We will share and promote at least one more version and probably two more versions of Humans Are Social Media. One after the processing of our spring 2021 content is complete and another final one when we're done with fall 2021 content, which is being produced now. I expect to request an ISBN and release the final version in 2022. Here's some of our spring 2021 content. For our Project 4 video, students like Preston used Creative Commons music and graphics. One of my first and favorite experiences with social media started on Instagram. Instagram first came out in 2010, which was my first year of middle school. At this time, all of the parents in my friend circle had handed down their old iPhone 3Gs to their kids, mainly for emergency contact purposes. I doubt that at this time they knew that giving us iPhones would ignite a digitally social revolution for every generation to come. My friend. That's a great story. Um, if you press play on this presentation on your own, if you download our slideshow on your own, you'll hear Emily Gustafson here. You'll hear her story that she tells. She never thought she would be an influencer on TikTok, but a TikTok she made went viral referring to wheelchair basketball. She talks about making content to make all these new fans happy, but then struggling with trolls to the point that she took her content down. I'm a new media scholar, and this kind of story is the essential backstory of what we see and don't see online. I'm so grateful to Emily and all the students who shared their work. And for the next year of the project, I'm eager to analyze our collections as a researcher. But in the meantime, I'm grateful to Cheryl Casey for studying the learning outcomes of this project from our very first semester through right now. And so Cheryl, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Diana. Yeah, this was a fascinating project, and I really wanted to learn from students' experiences um, creating content for this open textbook. So I surveyed Diana's classes uh, in fall 2020 and spring 2021. Um, for the survey instrument, I adapted existing questions from a paper by John Hilton and colleagues, and I just saw John in the chat, so thank you very much for, for, for openly sharing your questions so that we could adapt them. Uh, to get the extra credit that Diana offered for completing the survey, students submitted a screenshot of the survey completed screen in, in Qualtrics. So the results of the student surveys from the first two semesters were really encouraging. In all learning outcome categories, students much more frequently rated, rated learning with open pedagogy better than worse. In the first semester, about 66% of students said the HRSM project had greater educational value than traditional learning activities. The following semester, that percentage increased to 75.5. And from fall to spring, the percentage of students who thought learning outcomes were better with open pedagogy increased in all categories except mastering core academic content. Depending on the question, 2.4 uh, to 8.2% found the learning outcomes worse with open pedagogy uh, in the first semester. And the following semester, those percentages dropped to a range of 0 to 4.3%. I attribute the second semester drop uh, or the second semester increase in favorable results for open pedagogy to the improvements that Diana made in course content after the initial semester. She clarified instructions, um, she increased the assignment scaffolding, added press books, how-to videos. Diana, what else did you do? Uh, well, in the spirit of Universal Design for Learning, we offered instructions to for our assignments in more formats. Um, and that was also thanks to having more time to have worked on them and we'd hired more media lab workers. And also in response to feedback from the board that advises us, our community of scholars, we decreased our reliance on Adobe software and offered students more software options to get to the final product. You heard that a little bit in Jackie's video earlier where she was saying you can use what I used, which is Instagram, or you can use other software. That became our approach. 
Thanks. Another interesting thing I observed with the data is that in both semesters, the favorable outlook on open pedagogy dropped slightly as students progressed through the survey. One theory is that there was possible question fatigue. Um, students expressed some annoyance in <laughs> later questions with comments like, see previous answer. Um, but we could test this theory by mixing up the order of the survey questions uh, when we survey students this semester. Students were asked to imagine a future course and if they'd prefer one with traditional learning activities or one with activities like the HRSM project. Here again, we saw the preference for open pedagogy increase from the first to the second semester. Uh, the number of students who said they'd prefer to enroll in the section activities or section with activities like humans or social media rose from 50.6% in the fall to 62.4% in the spring. Again, I attribute this to improvements that Diana made in the class. And as she noted, there was a learning curve to using Pressbooks for the very first time um, on such a large scale. Themes of the open-ended questions um, or, or comments uh, were analyzed from the first semester in deduce software and students repeatedly used words like hands-on, interactive, relevant, and engaging to describe the textbook project. Creativity and connecting were other themes. In the open-ended comments, um, students wrote a lot about why they, what they liked about this project and why they thought the learning outcomes were better with humans or social media, as opposed to a traditional uh, learning approach. Um, here are some of the comments that stood out to me. Um, it made us feel like our opinions and our voices were heard and appreciated for the first time. That, that blew me away when I read that. I like how it put students' voices out in the world, gave me more incentive to make sure my assignments were my best product, more freeing, but equally as challenging. Um, I feel like I had more motivation um, to learn this way, learn more. And I think more classes should be like this. The students who rated the outcomes of the humans or social media project worse than traditional learning activities tend to cite technical difficulties, um, confusion or stress about the assignments, or just a personal preference for traditional activities over project-based learning. Here are some of those direct quotes. Um, confusing, easier uh, to do traditional learning activities when you have a massive workload because you know what to expect. Um, worried about doing things the right way, and the complexity, um, which as Diana said, she, she worked on in the second semester and this semester. So these findings, um, they resonated a, a lot with the goals of iVoices, I think. Students didn't necessarily feel they learned more than in a traditional classroom because we invited and applied funds of knowledge they already had, although they did learn from each other. Uh, but students did feel they learned better, more collaboratively and interactively with other online creators and with one another. Lessons I've learned in implementing this project so far relate mostly to key resources that I realized we'd really been relying on. Some of these I'd known to plan for, others were just a gift. Um, and then there are some that we wish we'd had, and so I'll get into that um, afterward. But first, institutional support is one of the three categories uh, that I've delineated, um, and that's been really essential in driving this project. And that includes funding I received from the Center for University Education and Scholarship at our university. This is funding for instructors doing research, and that's, that was a great uh, thing to be able to use. I'm especially grateful for library and technical resources and support also in that institutional support category. In the second category, open culture innovations included creative commons and open pedagogy tools like press books, which honestly made this project uh, possible. And then the third category I call knowledge, oh, sorry, knowledgeable creative labor. And that is really key to this work, uh, especially that of students that I work with. And uh, 
what we didn't have and what would have helped includes OER incentives at our institution, our university. More staff support would have been helpful and more planned research collaboration. Uh, I was frankly just lucky that, that Cheryl took enough interest in this project that we now have research findings because I've been too busy to do the research yet. I wrote that in in the third year. Um, and so planned research collaboration would have been really helpful. That's really beneficial for people who teach. I also look forward to Pressbook's continued development of areas like the users section. And if anybody from Pressbooks uh, and wants to talk to me about that, you know, let them know I'm I'm uh, happily available. I've really appreciated the use of Pressbooks in this project. In terms of supporting and assessing this this project from the library side, these are some of my takeaways. Um, I think our Pressbooks learning communities, both beginning and advanced, were a valuable way to scale trainings and form a community of practice. I've shared all of the resources from our learning communities um, in the Open Pedagogy Resources handout. With Pressbooks, um, my library partners with the Office of Digital Learning Unit on campus, um, which is instructional designers and technologists. We partner on the funding and network management. Um, highly recommend uh, you know, going into this as a collaboration. Adding Pressbooks single sign-on really reduced the number of emails from students about forgotten passwords and login issues, especially in a large class like this. Pressbooks technical support is fantastic. And I have to give a special shout out to Amy Song and to Steel Wagstaff for their kindness, their expertise, and their excellent customer support. I see a chat, yes. <laughs> Heart Amy, yeah, they're, they're, I just can't say enough about them. Um, we operate Pressbooks as a self-service model, which we don't have funding for grants or stipends or uh, course releases, and there are a lot of drawbacks to operating um, a, an OER publishing press books in this way. Um, it also limits, you know, the number of faculty who can afford to do OER creation. Developing more custom quick guides has been on the faculty request list, so um, that's on my to-do list uh, in coming months. There's a lot more research to do on this topic, but we think this study and this textbook project show the promise of open pedagogy as a tool for hands-on learning and expanding the diversity of voices and course materials. When creating an open textbook as an open pedagogy practice, plan ahead for student support, autonomy, assessment, and ongoing access to the textbook. And Diana will now share some other recommended best practices. Yeah, first, um, I would say open pedagogy like this really seems to work best. It may seem obvious, but in a domain of knowledge in which students are already immersed, uh, their knowledge will be practical before it's theoretical. Second, making an open textbook isn't just generating new content to integrate you are creating a collection, particularly when you're working with a big class across multiple semesters like I did. So you'll need help organizing and managing that collection. Apply for funding and plan for time for that considerable work and make sure you pay LIS interns when you do it. Um, third, balance your excitement about this project with deep understanding of the privacy implications of making student work public. Students' heavy use of social media in no way translates to an absence of concern about their own privacy. And fourth, but on a related note, we have the possibility of immersing students in a new vision for participatory culture, where instead of profit at the center, there's learning and shared knowledge and transparency. I really value that opportunity and you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to working more toward it and I hope I hope to, you know, have other people join me in doing that. This has just been a fantastic project uh, to watch Diana and her students in action. Um, that's the end of our prepared presentation. We've tried to leave lots of time for questions. So um, 
I'm going to see if I can see the participants here. If you have a question, go ahead and raise your Zoom hand and hopefully I'll be able to see you. Justin, yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself. Hey, Cheryl. Hi. I'm probably gonna be asking to meet with you and our OER librarian at some point in the future to get more details, but um, the collection phase, I have some more questions off. So when, once the course is, I guess, ready to be um, graded, the handoff goes from Deanna to the library or how does that handoff work? I, I manage that whole phase as well. Um, and, you know, that's when I listed that in the best practices at the end, I honestly, I did not realize that making a collection was part of this. I kind of thought we'd just generate content and then I'd pull from it for the textbook. And we tried to do it that way the first semester and just realized we don't really fully understand what we even have. We have what we have is a collection and we need to process it and organize it. Um, and so I supervise interns. I, it, the first semester that I worked, uh, well, I would spring 2021, which followed our first semester of, of gathering content. I actually supervised a team of 10 interns, MLIS interns. Uh, and I realized that was a little unwieldy. You know, it's, it doesn't count as a class or anything. It was basically just extra work. And so, so now I've met, i we move a little more slowly and I've got a team of three interns this semester. And I basically just supervise interns every semester and continue kind of working through those those collections. As far as the campus repository aspect, yeah. Um, Diana, yeah, do you want to talk about that aspect? That does sure. involve the library a little bit. Yeah, yeah, it does. Yeah, and I don't mean to say, oh, the library didn't help at all. What I kind of meant to say is, if I had planned this better, the library would be even more involved in this phase. Um, and it's just a question of never having done anything like this before, right? Um, but I did realize after a certain point um, that, okay, we have a collection and we need to honor it as such and treat it properly. And so I got in touch with our campus repository. Um, you know, and this is in addition to working with librarians, including Cheryl, including our copyright librarian. I've had a lot of support from librarians, which has been amazing, you know, from the very beginning with press books. But in terms of the collection, I then reached out to our campus repository and we almost have a collection ready for them now. Uh, so we'll, you know, I'm, I'm hoping to see it in that form and be able to tap into it as a researcher in that form in the future, in the near future. But in terms of our Pressbooks um, publishing program being self-service, I, I mean, we, we don't have the resources to help with program management or um, project planning, copy editing, uh, you know, any of that. It's basically a, a consultation service. And, um, you know, I, I visited the class to talk about open pedagogy and open licenses and philosophy in general. Um, but really, this was this was Diana and her students um, who did <laughs> the vast, vast bulk of the work. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, oh, I see. Mary has a question in chat. Can you talk a bit about the technical aspects of how students submitted their work and how you're managing that content? Were they uploading the content to a learning management system? That's a very good question. Uh, so the students upload directly to Pressbooks, but then they submit their URL to their chapter to the learning management system. And uh, in, in Pressbooks, I mean, I think there are some students who started 10 different chapters without realizing that they did it, but it can quickly, in a huge class, it can become a really unwieldy pile of content. So we learned pretty quickly by the second semester, have students create just one chapter and just try to emphasize, unless you absolutely can't find your chapter, um, name your chapter after your name. No one's going to see this uh, because this is... Uh, students are contributors and their content is not published, uh, except for an extra credit exception I'll talk about. Anyway, their content is not published during the semester while they're working on it. Um, they have one chapter that they work in. They create all their projects um, in that chapter. And each time they create a project, they submit the URL once the project is ready to that same chapter, 
you know, but with the understanding the newest work is at the top, they submit that to D2L, which is our learning management system. Does that help? I'm scrolling up to see the comments. Thank you, John, for the, the comment about um, appreciating the student-centered approach. That's what really impressed me about um, Diana's work as well. And uh, so we shared a copy of the MOU um, or, or the instructions for the MOU rather. Um, it does have the, the MOU content as well. Um, in the program page in SCED, along with the um, survey questions and along with these Google slides and a handout on open pedagogy resources, including the learning community that we formed for Pressbooks when we first launched it. Elaine has a question, is this something that can be easily used in business classes? Elaine, do you mean uh, an open textbook project, or do you mean this particular human social social media textbook? Go ahead and unmute yourself, but that's easier. Can you? I'm sorry. Can you re repeat the question, Cheryl? Oh, I saw in the chat um, that uh, is this something that can be easily used in business classes. And my, I was wondering if you meant an open textbook, open pedagogy project like this, or this particular humans or social media textbook. Yeah, this particular one, this particular oh, textbook. Yeah, it's it's available. Um, on the iVoices page, it's uh, available in the Open Textbook Library, in Merlot, in the Pressbooks directory. Anybody in the world can can use this in their classes. In their classes, and as Diana said, there's there's going to be more iterations coming. Okay, thank you. Yes, and and if your business classes, you know, we we do get into discussion of algorithms. Um, we, I would say that we probably have some chapters, certainly, that, that would be relevant to, to a business class, if not the entire book. Excellent. And Justin asked a question about the iVoices Innovation Pack, and uh, Diana put the, the link to that. Diana, can you say a little bit more about how that's curated? Uh, yeah, I mean, that was pretty simple. I have a really talented audio worker named Gabe who works on the podcast with myself and and uh, that student Jackie as well. And we have some other students in other specialty fields. But we we uh, just said, Gabe, can you can you put pull together some short Creative Commons track? Can you pull together some short tracks of music um, that you make yourself that we can license under Creative Commons? And that's what he did. <laughs> it was, there was very little, you know, it, this wasn't a, a case of curation of a bunch of different Creative Commons music. Uh, the, this was our media lab worker creating something new. So, um, you know, he, he created some things that were textures, some things that were melodies, drums, uh, et cetera. And so there's about 20 short tracks that students then in workshops with him, they choose pieces and they bring them in and work with them in, in Adobe audition or, or something else. Um, oh, thank you, uh, Cheryl for the CC mixer, uh, um, recommendation there. Yeah. One more, one more thing I'll say, and I know we're at 11, 11 but we did have some challenges, uh, with students finding creative commons music. There's so much out there that says royalty free, free to use that really confuses them. And they use that instead of creative commons. So that was one reason we created our own collection for them to pull from. We also, um, just sometimes said this project does not require music, but optionally you can include it. Uh, and one more thing we did is we have an extra credit forum where they get extra credit for submitting the tassel of a Creative Commons uh, song. I believe I mentioned that in the presentation, but that's that's been helpful in the semesters where we required a Creative Commons track, especially before we had our own music kind of to give them if they wanted to use that. So thank you, everybody. It looks like the session's about to end. Thank you all so much for attending.